Hello everyone and welcome. Pastor Greg Pog here from Christchurch Otsego and Bless Minnesota. The title of my message today is How to Live a Spirit-Filled Life. Don't you sense that all of us need something more at work in our lives right now than just our own wisdom and strength? I would suggest that we need supernatural power, the kind that Jesus promised would be available to all believers through the Holy Spirit. My goal today is to remind you of who the Holy Spirit is and how you can walk in His presence and power. I promise that when you do, you will be happier, you will be more fulfilled in every part of your life, and you will be a difference maker in this world. So let's begin with prayer and worship as we prepare our hearts to receive this message from God's Word today. Dear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we welcome you as we gather in our homes, our workplaces, our communities. We invite your spirit to be present and moving among us. Your word is spirit and life, and we ask you today to be our teacher as we look at this topic of the Holy Spirit. Bless us, Lord, speak to us. We gather in your precious name, amen.
things in all Hello again. This Sunday, May 31st, is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day that Christians celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the Christian Church. You may recall that when Jesus was raised from the dead on the first Easter Sunday, he told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem and wait until they were filled with power from on high. That power came 50 days later and their lives were never the same again. This story begins in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. We read, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You see, thousands of people had come to Jerusalem at that time to celebrate a Jewish harvest festival known as the Festival of Weeks. These travelers came from many different cities and nations, speaking dozens of different languages. But as you heard, when the Holy Spirit fell on those first disciples, they were able to go out into the marketplace and speak to all these visitors, each in their own languages. And I will just insert right here, that one of the things the Holy Spirit desires to do in our lives today is to help us to speak the language of the people we are trying to reach so that they might come to know Jesus as their Savior. Can you imagine the sight and sound of all those personal conversations taking place on the streets of Jerusalem that day? Amazing. But the story gets even better. Right in the midst of this personal witnessing, Peter stood up and began to preach what I would call the first Christian sermon. I don't think he had a fancy title with three main points, and he certainly wasn't live streaming over the internet. But I'll tell you this, Peter did a masterful job of capturing the attention of his audience by linking well-known Old Testament prophecies to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I mean, he brought together centuries of Jewish history in just a few minutes and then delivered the punchline. Peter declared, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The people said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? 3,000 people responded to that invitation and not only were their lives transformed, but the Christian church was born. And friends, the very things that they committed themselves to are the things that continue to breathe life into the true church today. Word and sacrament, worship and prayer, fellowship and hospitality, generosity, witness and service. Acts 2.47b concludes, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, within just a few decades, these disciples had taken the good news of Jesus to every corner of the known world. Many of them even gave their very lives for the cause of Christ. But somehow, during the last 2,000 years or so, too many Christians have lost this passion for witness and abandoned this Holy Spirit power that birthed the Christian church. Recent research shows that six in 10 churches in the United States have either plateaued or are declining in membership. 57% of American churches have less than 100 people gathering for worship on Sunday mornings. And our youngest two generations, most of our youth and young adults have simply walked away from the church, either ignorant of our beliefs or convinced that our message is judgmental and out of touch with society today. Would this not lead us to conclude that too many Christians are attempting to live religious lives by their own strength rather than spiritual lives that are dependent upon the Holy Spirit? 
So consider this a wake-up call. If you genuinely desire to experience the presence of God and the power of God and the guidance of God, you need all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How do you live a Spirit-filled life? You start right where you are. Number one, you get to know the Holy Spirit. For a variety of reasons, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, a lot of us are either uninformed, spooked by this mysterious, invisible power, fearful of being seen as a fanatic, or held captive by our denominational biases. I mean, I see all of these factors in play today. We're not the first ones. There's a story in the Bible of the Apostle Paul arriving in a place called Ephesus. There he found some new believers in Jesus and wanting to help them grow, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I wonder if Paul wasn't quite surprised by their answer. But talk about an open door to some personal teaching and ministry. In the same way, a lot of people today are simply uninformed. Don't be shocked by this, but use it as an opportunity to share who the Holy Spirit is and what he was sent to do. Friends, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. You won't find this word in the Bible anywhere, but its reality is taught through and through. God the Father is our creator and the sustainer of life. Jesus, the Son of God, is our Savior and friend. And the Holy Spirit is the invisible, indwelling presence of Jesus who serves as our comforter, counselor, and source of spiritual power. One God, three persons. It can be confusing. Here are a couple of examples that might help. H2O, what is it? Well, water, right? Yes, but H2O, as you know, can be experienced in three different forms, liquid, ice, and steam. Each of them is still H2O. They're still water. Three forms, but one substance, just like the Holy Trinity. Three persons, but one God. Or think of it in terms of relationships. I'm Greg Pog, one person, most of the time, unless I'm having a really bad day. <laughs> but at the same time that I am just one person, relationally, I am a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend, and more. Different relationships, different functions and responsibilities within the context of those relationships. But still, I'm just one person. So it is with the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit operate in relationship to one another, sort of like a family. Each person of the Trinity has different sets of functions and responsibilities. But even in this diversity, there is unity. Three persons, but one God. I hope that helps at least a little bit. So yes, there has been a lack of knowledge about who the Holy Spirit is. There has also been a fear factor. For starters, for centuries, the term used for the Holy Spirit was Holy Ghost, which comes out of the King James Version of the Bible. And you don't invite a ghost to possess you. You don't cuddle up with a ghost. You scream and run away, or you call Ghostbusters. And so a lot of people have been afraid to get to know the Holy Spirit, this elusive and even sometimes fearful-sounding member of the Trinity. Another negative is that we may have been told or actually experienced it ourselves that those who get filled with the Holy Spirit can get a little crazy at times in their enthusiasm for Jesus. At the worst, they can develop an I've got something you don't have mentality that leads to a judgmental attitude toward others and can cause division in the church. So while many of us gladly acknowledge our need for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the last thing we want is for somebody to think that we've gone off the deep end. So we shy away from this part of the Bible's teaching. Denominationalism hasn't helped either. Lutherans and Catholics, Baptists and Pentecostals, every denomination seems to have its own unique understanding of the role and function of the Holy Spirit. Some welcome him. Others are afraid of him. Still others deny that he gives gifts that are meant to function today. It can be really confusing. Now, many of these theological arguments can be interesting to discuss, but let's just cut to the chase. 
When you read your Bible, it quickly becomes clear that to live a full and blessed Christian life, you need the full meal deal. You can't order the members of the Trinity a la carte. That's why I'm inviting you today to get to know the Holy Spirit and what he can mean for your life. God the Father created you and Jesus saved you, yes, but it is the Holy Spirit who desires to fill you with the very presence and power of Jesus right now so that you can live every day to the max. How do you live a Spirit-filled life? First, you get to know the Holy Spirit. Then number two, you get baptized by the Holy Spirit. From the day of Pentecost forward, salvation in Jesus was always to be accompanied by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see it in the book of Acts. Sometimes water baptism came first and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Other times the Holy Spirit was poured out first and then people were water baptized. But the two were never to be separated again. Baptism is far more than a Christian ritual. It is meant to be a power encounter with God. And Jesus' baptism sets the precedent. Jesus was 30 years old now and about to begin his public ministry. He went to the Jordan River where his cousin, John the Baptist, was baptizing people for the repentance of sin. John prophesied that something new was coming. In Mark 1, verse 8, he said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Right on cue, Jesus showed up, and as he always did, showed us the way. As he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And God the Father's voice spoke from heaven saying, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Did you notice who was in attendance at Jesus' baptism party? Yes, all three members of the Trinity were there. This was a prelude to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Make no mistake, baptism is about the washing away of sin and the affirmation of our belonging to the family of God. But it is also about the infilling of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live the Christian life. If Jesus needed this experience in his life, how much more must we need it? And this gift is not a one and done. I grew up in the Lutheran tradition. I was therefore baptized in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I was only about six weeks old. I appreciate my infant baptism, and even as a child, I sensed the work of the Spirit in my life, filling me with Jesus' love, guiding me in my decisions, and giving me a desire to love and serve others. When I was a teen, I attended some international conferences on the Holy Spirit in Minneapolis, and I learned about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wasn't taught that I was missing something, I just realized that there was more. That pilot light in my heart was about to be fanned into a full burning flame. I guess you could say that I experienced my own personal Pentecost. I learned that you can't keep giving out to others in this Christian life if you're not at the same time continuously being filled up by the Holy Spirit. That's why there's so much burnout in the church today. If you're not walking wet, you'll soon end up like a dried out sponge. Not much good for the purpose for which it was created. So one day as a young man, I prayed and I was prayed for. It was a powerful moment in my life because I experienced a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit that by God's grace has been continuously refreshed ever since. My love for God grew and so did the gifts and fruits of God at work in my life. By the time I was a junior in college, I sensed that the Holy Spirit was drawing me into deeper ministry to serve as a pastor. I responded to that call. And in just a few weeks, on June 22nd, I'll be celebrating 40 years of ordained ministry. My testimony is this. Apart from the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us and through us, we can accomplish nothing that will last. But here's the flip side. With God... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all things are possible. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Even a better question is, are you experiencing the ongoing baptism of the Spirit in your life right now? 
or are you running dry? There isn't any magic to receiving this gift. All you need to do is ask. Just pray and ask God for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life, whether you are alone or among a group of believers who will pray for you too. God is so faithful and he will never deny you this blessing. We all need a personal Pentecost. We all need to be constantly filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Remember Peter's response to those who asked, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've been praying all week that God will pour out his Spirit anew on this congregation and the people I love as well as blow the fresh wind of the Spirit all across the state of Minnesota. I'm standing in faith that this move of God is coming soon. As a matter of fact, I see it already happening, even in the midst of this pandemic. It's often true that when we are tested the most, we learn what it means to really rely on God. So to be baptized by the Holy Spirit isn't about a certificate to frame or a church membership to claim. It's about a transformed life and the power to live for Jesus every day. Once you get to know the Holy Spirit and are baptized by the Holy Spirit, to live a Spirit-filled life, number three, you develop the fruits of the Spirit. What does this mean? Well, in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, the Apostle Paul describes some qualities that we could say are the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, there is no limit to how many or how much of these qualities should be found in the life of a growing, maturing, Spirit-filled Christian. A fruit tree should bear fruit. Likewise, a Christian should exhibit these fruits of the Spirit in their daily lives. Now, you undoubtedly have many of these qualities at work in your life right now. But if you're like me, you will also admit that there is still plenty of room for growth. For example, you may be a loving person, but still struggle occasionally with self-control. You may have peace in your heart, but yet still be lacking in consistent faithfulness to God. You may be a kind person, but really wish that you had more patience with people. Get the picture? Growing these fruits of the Spirit is a lifelong journey. I love that maxim that says, I'm not the person I want to be, but praise God, I'm also not the person I used to be. To live a Spirit-filled life, it's important to celebrate your progress, but continue to grow in developing these qualities. Why? Well, because... These are the qualities that lead to a blessed life and a faithful witness to others. There's more. To live a Spirit-filled life, number four, you exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have each been given gifts to share for the purpose of being a witness to others and building up the family of God. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, the Apostle Paul reminds us of their importance. He says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Some of the gifts that God gives are supernatural in nature. Therefore, you might think that you have to be a super Christian to receive any one of these gifts, but no. They are available to every believer. The Bible describes gifts like a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, the working of miracles, the discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. Paul encourages you to desire every spiritual gift from God and to not neglect the gift that is within you. Sometimes these are called charismatic gifts, but it's fascinating because the root of that word charismatic is charis, which is the Greek word for grace. These spiritual gifts are to be a sign of the grace of God at work in our lives for the sake of the world. 
They are never about us. But the gifts of the Spirit don't stop there. Other places in the Bible refer to very practical gifts like teaching, leading, administering, serving, giving, hospitality, and more. What gifts has God given you? Paul says, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Are you aware of your spiritual gifts? Are you exercising them so that they build up the body of Christ and give glory to God? These spiritual gifts are not just for the church. They are for the home, the workplace, the school, and the community. To live a Spirit-filled life, we are challenged to continuously develop the fruits of the Spirit and continuously exercise the gifts of the Spirit. God intends every gift to be a blessing in our lives. So my attitude has always been, bring them on, Lord. I am open to receive whatever gifts you have for me because I want to serve you with all my heart and I need all the help I can get. When we are open to receive in this way, life gets really exciting. It's then that we are able to experience the presence and power of God at work in our lives in ways that we never imagined possible. But here's another important element. To live a spirit-filled life, number five, you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that as Christians, it's vital that we learn to hear the voice of God in order to discern his will for our lives. To hear his voice speaking to us through the Holy Spirit, we have to become good listeners. A confession, the honest truth. I'm a much better talker than I am a listener. You never would have guessed it, right? At times, I have real difficulty slowing down enough and getting quiet enough in God's presence to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Do you run into this problem too? The challenge is that when we find ourselves mostly asking God to bless the decisions we've already made, rather than guiding us in the decisions we should make, it lands us in a lot of trouble. A godly professor of mine once said, you can run the rat race your whole life, and the best you'll ever end up is head rat. I always like that one. Passion and commitment to our work and daily activities are great, but how much better if we slowed down enough to really seek the Holy Spirit for his wisdom and guidance. What a difference that would make. You see, we are promised over and over in the scriptures that when we seek Jesus, we will find him, and he will reveal his wisdom to us. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. Some very encouraging words. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. How do we hear the voice of God? and receive the wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit for our lives, we call on God in every situation, and then we learn to be still and listen. Jesus made it so clear. He told his disciples, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. That's Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Just think of all the stuff we listen to in this world. Our brains are bombarded with thousands of inputs every day. We listen to parents, siblings, and friends. We listen to bosses, teachers, and coaches. We listen to the news on TV and the internet. We listen to various philosophies and opinions about life. Many of these voices are positive, but a lot of them are not. Some of the counsel we receive represent the words of the devil himself. How do we know what is true and what is false? We learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 13, Jesus said, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks by illuminating God's Word, the Bible. It's like He shines a light on a word or a phrase or a concept that we may have heard a million times, but this time 
its truth just strikes right to the heart and we know that it is the Holy Spirit talking to us. And by the way, this is why reading our Bibles devotionally or studying them together with a small group is so important. The Holy Spirit also speaks through our brothers and sisters in Christ with whom we share life, and it's so much fun. You see, the Holy Spirit often speaks by teaching us things. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Yes, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. When you need a divine solution to a human problem, why not go to him instead of just muddling through yourself? Years after George Washington Carver had become famous for all of his inventions with the peanut, he was asked to testify before Congress. Knowing of his strong faith, a senator asked him, Dr. Carver, does the Bible tell about peanuts? <laughs> no, sir, Dr. Carver replied, but it tells about the God who made the peanuts. I asked him to show me what to do with the peanut, and he did. Friends, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you need to know if you are willing to seek him and listen for his voice. When you're in a relationship and just don't understand the other person's thoughts or feelings, you can ask the Holy Spirit for insight and wisdom in terms of how to respond. When you're feeling stuck and needing renewed inspiration to pursue your dreams or complete a difficult task at hand, you can ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to see the answer and give you the strength you need. When you observe what's going on in this world and wonder how to respond, you can ask the Holy Spirit to counsel you and show you ways to make a positive change. And then sometimes the Holy Spirit simply reminds us of Jesus' words. It was there in the second half of John 14, 26. Jesus said, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So simple, but so powerful. The Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus' words, of Jesus' actions, because he is always our bottom line. Remember WWJD? What would Jesus do? To live a Spirit-filled life, we must listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and always ask, what would Jesus do? I hope this teaching is being helpful for you. Before we close, I've got one more action step for those who want to learn how to live a Spirit-filled life. Number six, you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember the old Flintstones cartoons? How did Fred power his car? Well, it was with his feet, right? When it comes to the Christian life, a lot of us are the same. We try to get ahead under our own power and usually come up about a mile short. God our Father saw our need and sent the Holy Spirit to be the fuel for our engines. What is this power? Well, check out Romans 8.11 for an amazing insight. Paul said, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Now that's profound. The power of the Holy Spirit that we have been talking about is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Was that some kind of power? It sure was. To turn death into life is the greatest power of all. And this resurrection power has now been given to every believer to help you live an abundant, fulfilling, and effective life for Jesus every day. How do you get it, this Holy Spirit power? As I've said, you get to know the Holy Spirit. You get baptized by the Spirit. You develop the fruits of the Spirit and exercise the gifts of the Spirit. You listen to the voice of the Spirit. All of these things equip you and prepare you to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit every day. It's called the Spirit-filled life. In Zechariah 4.6 it says, This is the word of the Lord, not by might nor by power like Fred Flintstone, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The world, the church, and each of us as believers have never been in greater need of this supernatural power. On the day of Pentecost, 
God made this awesome power available to each of us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we want to overcome the challenges that we're all facing right now, and the many more that will certainly come in the future, if we want to rise up as the people of God for such a time as this, we must be baptized and filled by the Holy Spirit to overflowing once again. We must learn to walk in His presence and power every day as we live the Spirit-filled life. John Legend, a wonderful singer, is best known for his love song, All of Me. The chorus goes, All of me loves all of you. As I close today, what if we each made this a praise chorus in our own hearts to God? What if we sang, God, all of me loves all of you. And so right now, I intentionally invite your Holy Spirit into my life to fill me and empower me. Friends, if you're willing to make this your song today, your prayer today, I promise God will pour out his Holy Spirit on you just as he did his very first disciples and your life will never be the same again. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you not only that you sent your son Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, but also that in Jesus' absence, you sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to be our teacher, to be our counselor, to guide us into the truth, and most importantly, to empower us to live the Christian life. And so we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit by faith again today. We ask you to stir up that flame within us that it might burn brightly as we seek to reach the world in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, empower the church and empower every believer. In your name we pray, amen. I've been so blessed to share this message with you today. Thank you for listening and responding. I think that this is such an important word for the world right now. If you've been watching on Facebook, would, would you please share this message with your friends? Let's get the truth about the Holy Spirit out there to everyone. Because we're making a weekly investment in doing the same here at Christ Church Otsego, and also through Bless Minnesota, we really appreciate your financial support as God enables you. Once again, you can make gifts online at christchurchotsego.org slash give, or by texting keyword CCO space give to 77977. Even as we grow our online community, if you live in the Northwest Twin Cities Metro, we want to invite you to make Christ Church Otsego your church home. You can find more information at our website where you can fill out a connection card or share your prayer requests. And if you would like to email one of our staff or talk to us personally, all the info is there. We look forward to meeting you in person one day soon. Our statewide Bless Minnesota movement also continues to grow. So please visit us at blessminnesota.org and learn about our various initiatives and how you, your church, your business, your community can get involved. And now may God fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you may personally know his presence and experience his power. Have a wonderful week and may God bless you all until we meet again.